Yara. Now, double gents upon that. Susan Pye, but how are you? Catholic seat of wisdom. The night of St. John's International. Funyinara. And now, what's some pun away to watch our own for so? Oh, Chami. Sitchendo, ma'am. A crab whipper, Bamba Bata for Kufuna Ranku Mom. A Dumak Manish Romu Dumon Pem say as it so chicho so bo so seno and all fit on Ponko Sishi Medawasi Zobo to Trinibe Sena Crabo. She don't be so few days on Sacrache. No mum came with day. A pin bottle to win you far. No pedat to tow bunkum. No one you could see in his boom, I won't fuck it ya. Or Charles and Martha, we am ye. Or Sunday, or breath for mobble, next cinnamon or brain soon. Demit no offer, I am ye fun. Demit no offer, could do fun. Demit no offer, or couldn't he? You drink a former for that. For his good works, it shall continue to reign. His impact will forever be on our heart. O Benfo, O Kukudufo, O Siadeo, say a boo dear boo, a bedding a bomb brania, nephew say. Boo, ne o boafoa, was your o brefo ewo quantanaso, naman and brinsu. O coni, a sera no cassa, Missre, Pijamu, Pijamu, Dan down home. Down down home. No, we are who say. A room or say a day. Mr. Buffer in Namfra. Mumbum Emano. Yet I must say. Chema, me da wasi, me bre, yami inshiao. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I continue speaking, I would humbly indulge, ask the chair to indulge me so the Catholic Seat of Wisdom sings one of my favorite tunes. I believe I have your permission, Chair. Thank you very much. Kwa.
is his faithfulness, and great has been his faithfulness. Vice Chancellor, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I have a few dedications before I continue, Chair. I wish to dedicate this day to God Almighty for how far he's brought me. I say a big thank you to my dad, Mr. Kofor Date, who had to put his career on hold to stay in Cape Coast so he could educate his children. <laughs> to my mother, Mrs. Theresa Kofor, who had very little education but knew of the value of education, so supported all the kids to go through school. To Abba Penny, a child, my grandmother who is with us today, Nana Medasi. To my siblings, Nana Kwame, who had to come from UK, Kwame Medasi P. Mamiya, if you say, all my nephews and nieces for your love and support, I say, I'm very thankful. To the BMC number one royal family in the Amfo, Madam Unyase. To Abapa, Mami Siama, my roommates, my support, my backbone, Mami Medasi. To my daughter, who gave me the reason to continue and to push on to leave Mami Sapon. I named her after my mother because of how great my mother and how supporting my mother has been to me. Jenny, daddy loves you. We told our teachers matter. To all my teachers who are here, I say I'm grateful to you, but I wish to single two of them out. The rest of you, um, forgive me. To Mr. Aqua, who is here with us, Mr. Aqua, Mr. Aqua first taught me as a private tutor when I was in class four. I wasn't a good student. My dad knew I was weak, so he got me a private tutor. Mr. Aqua came to a house to teach me. Mr. Aqua took me to Jubilee School to teach me and my colleagues. And I can see Albert Mesa Tando here. He pushed me to do common entrance at class five when I didn't even know what schooling was and why I was in school. I first had common entrance at the Jubilee School, although I was a, a pupil of University Primary School. I didn't get to go to grade. So he said, listen, young man, you push on. So I, I came back. He took me on. We worked through till I got to pass common entrance. We start with Nyami Shaw. Chair, before I begin my lecture, permit me to break protocol briefly. There's a gentleman in this auditorium before whom I cannot consider myself a professor. And to be able to profess, I need his permission. Professor Kofi Osawaza, he told me not to do this, I'll do it. <laughs> Prof Chair, please permit me to profess today. I wait for your response before I continue, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof Chair. Please let's give it up to Professor Kofi Osawaza. This is all down to Professor Kofi Osawaza. I probably would be a bugger somewhere without him. So I call him my father. Anytime I refer to anybody as a father, he is my father. This is my dad. He is my father. <laughs> Vice Chancellor, permit me to associate myself with already established protocol. As I associate myself with a protocol, let me add to the protocol. Permit me. In our presence is the Emeritus Archbishop of Cape Coast, his Lordship, His Grace, Matthias Enketia, who is a spiritual director and has been a backbone to me. Nana, Medasi. There are a number of Catholic priests in the hall, and I, I acknowledge all of you. To my brother, friend, Sheikh, Bustafa Amit, I acknowledge you. To Lawyer Ajete, I know you're trying to hide, but I've seen you. The Special Assistant to the Minister of Education, I acknowledge your presence. Chair, the title of this presentation is Eating 
And the chairman asked me a while ago, why two versions of eating? And I told him that some have eaten and some are eating. <laughs> that is why I chose to have that rendition of eating. But chair, as we go along, I'm sure all of us will appreciate the eating and the eating. Sorry. Chair, my outline of the presentation is this, that I'll first look at my journey, what has motivated my re research. I'll give a background to the topic that I'm delivering on. I'll briefly talk about what I call the biosocial pathway to young people's sexual behavior. I'll look at some regimes or frameworks that have been used and are being used to regulate sexual behavior. I'll briefly touch on data and methods. I wouldn't bore you with data and methods. Then I'll reflect on the forbidden fruits. I know a number of you have your own, in your own mind, what a forbidden fruit is, but which? I'll look at the implications of these forbidden fruits. I'll give a few concluding thoughts. I'll touch briefly on my contribution to the discourse, social dimensions of sexual and productive health, and end by looking at some contributions that I've made in my short life to national development. Chair, my journey. Um, the chair has touched on part of my journey, and it's an interesting journey. I was born on the 23rd of March, 1974, in a village called Yanfo, the then Bono Ahavo region, now Ahavo region. The life journey took us to Asaman Kese, took us to Tema. Then my father was transferred to Cape Post. Like I said, decided to stay in Cape Post because he, he thought this was a place he could um, educate, good, give his kids good education. My family comes from BMSU number one in the Ashanti region but the family lives in the Amfo. And I must say I'm a proud royal from being so. Chair schooling started at university primary school, a very slow starter. Didn't know what life was. I had, I had to go to school because I had been asked to go to school. Like I said, Mr. Aqua saved me. I went to St. Augustine's College. First three years were a struggle. Any time I went home, my father would ask me if all, all was well. Because I always returned seven, eight, nine in maths, um, physics, chemistry, and all those other things. Then form four came. We did a special math for people to be selected into the various areas. Weak as I was in maths, I missed. I didn't even think of dream of doing science anyway. I enrolled. I got into the business class. Did business for O level. Did business for A level. After all level, being weak in maths, my father knew I was weak in maths. My father gave me money for extra classes. My father got teachers for me. But as a teen that I was, I need to tell you that those monies never went to those teachers. <laughs> stubborn boys, stubborn academies in Augustine's College. So, you know, God has a way of doing things. God said, listen, because you had wasted your father's money, you waste some more. So you stay home after all level. So I finished all level. I got seven in maths. I knew I could go to school with seven because I knew my father could take me to school. Because my father had taken other people to school with seven. But I said, Kofi won't go to school. My mother, my mother always would find a way. She got me admission, but she was giving a threat. And if Kofi goes to school, you're going back to Yamfu. So she also got scared. Then daddy came home one afternoon with a mass set, a graph book, timetable from Workers College. Workers College um, around the Ola, the Central Gate. Then um, I believe uh, Mr. Ampamensa's um, sons are here. Mr. Ampamensa, may his own rest in peace, his phone number and locate his address that, Kofi, I'm going to Sunyani. Go to Mr. Ampamensa for math. This is your timetable. Go to Workers College. 
I cried my eyes out. But daddy will not budge. And I thank him for doing that to me. For me, it was a turning point in my career. I went to A-level to do A-level. And I did A-level straight away. Um, I believe Mr. Akumse Barnes is here. Thank you very much, Mr. Akumse Barnes, for what you did for me doing my A-level days. We finished A-level when it was time to come to the university. I chose Legon, I chose UCC. I was tired of living in UCC, so I wanted to go to Accra. But Legon gave me something, as they always do. I'm not sure what they had given me. I think they gave me, I don't, please, no offense to anybody, but a business student, they gave me archaeology, philosophy, classical civilization. And I asked myself, what is this? I took that, um, the admission letter, all right. I said, listen, this will not work for me. I don't know what the prospects are. So what did I do? I said, I wanted to do become. And they said, become, you do it four years or three years. I said, if it's not three years, I won't do it. Because we had, we had, the SS system was now getting into the university. And we thought A-level boys don't mix with SS boys. So I wasn't going to do a four-year program. So I came here. And there was a place called Gambia. Those of you who know the University of Cape Coast. I was in Gambia. You know, Gambia Embassy. And a, there was an embassy. That embassy is an area between the current hyper and the kingdom bookshop. That stretch was called Gambia. Young boys and girls who come and line up in there hoping that somebody will hear their plight and give them admission. We stayed in Gambia for close to one month. Every morning, 8 a.m., we we'll dress up, go to the embassy, and go and wait. We made good friends, and some of them, are, I believe, are here. We did that for one month. When the workers were on break, we also went on break. We went to eat Ochi in Ola and other places. And people were going for lectures. And we were in Gambia hoping that we get admission into this university. The day before matriculation was when it happened for me. It was around 4 o'clock, and there was an announcement that this is the last list. Tomorrow is matriculation. If your name is on the list, you are out. But I had my Legon letter in my pocket, so I had one eye looking at Legon and how things were going. Dr. Isaac Ohine, thank you very much. He was the senior attorney registrar for academic affairs. So we went to line up in front of his office. His office was close to the old administration bloss garage. Ladies and gentlemen, keep quiet. There's a young man who has come from the United States of America and insists that we should mount a course. The course is called Puffler. I said, Paul, what? <laughs> Nobody knew what Puffler was. I'm going to mention their names. If you hear a name, raise up your hand. If you, if you do not raise, raise your hand, I will strike up your name, out your name and continue. Mr. Ohine, then now Dr. Ohine started. Number one, he said, we're taking only 10 people. Number one, after number nine, I'm not sure enough. Number 10, Eugene Kufoma after that. That is how I find myself in the University of Cape Coast. With a training in business, coming to do business, my father never wanted me to do business because my father is an accountant. He said we, could not, not all of us, we should not all do the same thing, so he wanted me to do something else. He wanted me to do geography, I ran away from geography, but I found myself in the Department of Geography, doing a program called Population and Family Life Education. We're called the condom graduates. Because <laughs> any time we met, it was condom, it was sex, and I remember one of our lecturers, Mrs. Badasu, thank you, Mrs. Badasu, said, excuse me, can I say sex? I said, whoa. She could not say sex without excusing herself and excusing us. Over the years, we could say sex and I now say sex without um, blinking an eye or batting an eyelid. I did three years of population and family life education. One day I was going for a lecture, and those who know me know that I have a very lazy fair attitude to things. Walking lazily to a lecture, and a young man, and, uh, well, he was a young man then. He called me to his office. He said, where do you come from? I said, I'm from, I'm from Yamfu. Then you are walking like somebody who's gone, gone to farm and is returning from Ebutu. I didn't even know where Ebutu was. You know who this person was? Professor Kofi Osobasari. 
that is where a relationship that he had with my father became um, a relationship with me. He took me as a son, I've been a son. Post first degree, I went to London because that was, I thought money was a thing to do. You know, we needed to look for money because the London boys came back with some money, ghetto blaster and other things. And we wanted to also um, get some of these things. When they had parties and he did not have a bus pass, you could not attend the party. So we went to London so we could accumulate some bus passes. So we could, we could attend party with the London boys. I called him one day and my mom was like, your daddy wants to speak to you. He hardly speaks. So when he wants to speak to you, it means there's something serious he wants to tell you. Say, Kofi, when are you coming? Say, coming where? Say, coming back to Ghana. Say, ah, da. Chenka cry. I said, no. Your father says you should come. And whenever your father comes in, you know the, 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 the person. It's that man sitting there. Say, my father says I should come and do it. Say, your father says if you stay in London, you waste your life, so come back. Being somebody who um, listens very much to my parents, I returned home. Then Prof started engaging. Say, Kofi, what are you doing after um, service? Say, Prof, I want to work because I need money. Money is down there. So why don't you enroll for a master's? Before he told me, he had spoken to my dad. So I, when I went home, my dad gave me money. I think the form was around 2 million cities, 200 cities. What pass it, brass school, did you cut off form? I said, ah. Again. So I picked the form, took the form home, left it on my table. I never filled the form. Prof, when Prof, the list of um, applicants was submitted to the department, my name was, was not on it. So he called me again. Prof, I also called me. Kofi, the list is in your name is not on it. What happened? Say, Prof, you know, they, had, they made a mistake with my certificate. My mouth was always spelled with an R. And it was true they made a mistake with my certificate. So listen, you finish school here, you don't need your, we don't need your certificates. Go and bring the form. That was when I went to fill the form. Prof, thanks for pushing me. So I brought the form to him. Then he put a note on it, a sticky note. Then to, back to Mr. Henry who was still the assistant, the senior assistant registrar academic affairs. Say, Kofi, this is a young man we wish to train and retain. So kindly submit a submitted list as a haircut. So that's how come I came to do masters. It wasn't something that I really wanted to do, but my father insisted. I went to Nairobi for three years. My father asked me to go to Nairobi, and I went to Nairobi. And I'm sure I came back a better person. It was him who brought me back from Nairobi. He visited, Kofi, what's happening? I said, Daddy, I want to go and do a PhD. He said, the PhD is not coming, so why don't you come and join us? He sent somebody to deliver an application form and insisted that the person returns to Ghana with the application form. Kofi one day, I don't know if Kofi is here, Kofi delivered the form to Nairobi and back to Ghana. So I came back to Ghana. Prof. Sadobi interviewed me, gave me a job. Thank you, Prof. Now, my first paycheck, which really nearly changed my life, was 500 Ghana cities. I looked, I took, immediately I got the, the pay slip. I went to Prof.'s office. I said, Prof., this will not work. I was living a life of a diplomat, tax free, driving a red number plate eating whatever I wanted to eat. Now you're giving me 500 cities. So Prof. Kofi said now, Kofi, this is how we've been managing it. We'll be fine. We'll get projects. We'll be OK. I had to listen to my father. And I listened to him. And I want, I want to say that I've never regretted listening to my father. I've never regretted choosing this noble career. Prof. Chair, What has motivated me to do the research I do, Prof. Chair? I mentioned my date of birth, but I'm told that my date of birth is two months shy of my original date of birth. So I was born, I was born premature in a village without incubators. 
to a young woman. If she was a bit younger, she probably would have been part of the people I'll be talking about today. Through God's grace and my grandmother's ingenuity, I survived, and I'm here today. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Grandma. When I started doing population life, I started reading, I realized that children or babies born to young women were at a higher risk of becoming um, low weight, having low birth weight. These children were at higher risk of dying. And there are so many things which happen to children of young women. So with, through my readings, when I came across that, I told myself, listen, can I do anything that will make um, these young women delay having children early? Or to see if the children can survive it. So one of the things that has motivated me is my bed situation. My godfather has played a crucial role in my life in this because he was doing HIV, AIDS, and sex, and all that. I did my national service in the then National Commission of Women and Development. I was a project officer in charge of gender, and I saw how vulnerable women and girl um, children were. It a bit to also contribute to making the world a better place. I've aligned my work to SDGs 1, 4, and 5. MDGs 1, 4, and 5, and SDGs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 looks at no hunger, no poverty, um, good health. Also look at gender, equality, and um, education. Now, I believe that if we have health and well-being, then we're able to, we'll be able to achieve these SDGs. Prof Chair, the people I'm talking about today are young people who are aged between age 15 and 24 years. And the numbers show that these people are 16% of the global population, and we expect them to be about 23% by 2030. The proportion of young people in the sub-region is about 20%. And these 20%, this 20% also reflects the um, population of young people in Ghana. Chair, these young people go through a number of changes. These are social, these are emotional, physical and physiological. Socially, young people generally, especially women, want to form attachments, are affected by peers. They want to um, associate with subculture and so on and so forth. Emotionally, they, they do not want rejection. They always want acceptance. They always want acceptance. But because they want acceptance, they are all likely to do things that are not accepted or permitted. Prof. Chair, it might interest you to do, ladies and gentlemen, that from the current GDHs, 15% of young people ages 15 and 19 years have given birth. 15 to 19 years. Only God knows what sort of outcome they are. Prof. Chair, when they're going through the fiscal changes, a number of things happen. Puberty sets in, there's a growth spurt, and a friend of mine describes that the, the women especially develop what he calls the Coca-Cola um, Coca shape. This Coca-Cola shape creates, it comes with its own problems, these own storms and stresses. And these young women also experience what we call thalaki, or breast development. The other thing that happens to them is menarche, and I want to dwell a bit on menarche because it's the first menstruation of the young people. It signals sexual development, but it does not necessarily signal sexual maturity. Sometimes we think that once you develop, you're mature, but that's not the case. Their sexual development, they have the age to have sex, they can have sex, but they shouldn't be having sex because they're not mature to have sex because when they do, there'll be a lot of negative ramifications. Chair, when you look at menarche, in the days of our mothers and mothers, menarche would, spy, would start around 14, 16, and when it happened, there was what they called the rites of passage. These women were prepared for marriage and invariably, marriage in those times was equal to childbirth. And I must say, Chair, that childbirth, whether in or out of marriage, is a risky behavior. 
With development with science, Menaki now is starting at nine for some, 10, 11. But where are the right of passages? None. Where are the parents who are to educate the girls? They are nowhere to be found. So there's a, a long period of development. And we say they are not mature, so they should wait. How do they wait? What should they do to wait? Chair, these are the questions that come up. Currently, the fair age at first sex is, um, the median age at first sex is 17 years. Median age at first um, marriage is 24 years. Five years difference between um, sex and birth. What happens? Who are they having sex with? What sort of sex are they having? Chair, to try to um, explain sexual activity among young women, you do a trial, used hormones, measured hormones, and interacted the hormones with some social factors to see which one predicted sexual behavior of women and girls and boys. You do a trial tells us that for the girls, it's a combination of the hormones and more of the social environment. And um, those of you who have read Bandura's work will know that um, people learn. We learn by imitating. So if a young lady finds herself in, the, in an environment where there's a lot of permissiveness, where sex happens, sexual activities arrive, she's likely to engage in sex despite having low hormones. In the case of boys, environment do not matter. What matters most are the hormones. Once the hormones kick in, the boys are good to go. Permitting them or not, they will be good to go. So basically that's what you do at all. And this is what has explained sexual activity of young men and women. Next slide, please. Chair, to regulate the sexual activities of people, now I'm focusing more on women, there are a number of regimes. There are the legal regimes. There are the socio-cultural or traditional moral regimes. We also have what I call the romantic moral regime. And there's also the religious moral regime. I'll touch briefly on each of these regimes, Prof. Chair. The legal regime sets um, policies, acts, and laws to regulate sexual behavior of the people in the country. So for instance, in Ghana, the legal regime has it that age of consent is 16. Until you are 16 years, you cannot consent to sex. When it comes to marriage, the legal age of marriage is 18. I sometimes wonder why we, we said 16 for beginning sex and 18 for marriage. The question I always ask myself and I continue to ask myself is, what happens between 16 and 18? If you say they can have sex at 16, but they can only marry at 18, are we promoting premarital sex? I don't know. Maybe they want us to test the cars before we buy them. I'm not sure what, if that's what it is. A lot of scholars have raised issues with this, but that is what we have as a country. Traditionally, and here I'm going to look at Rattray's work of 1927 when he looks at sexual offenses among Akans. And what Rattray did, and here, Prof. Chair, permit me, these are in Akan, and I'll say them as they appear. <coughs> Sorry. Water. Chair, Rattray said one of the offenses in Akan was Ahaha Tre. Ahaha Tre. Translated to mean sex in the bush. He also had Mojafra. which is mixing of blood. And I'm sure today, in language, you call it incest. And he talked about Chebenfie. Chebenfie is sex, which is close to the house. Literal transition, translation. Now, these were offenses, and I believe that these offenses were supposed to protect the sanctity of sex. <laughs> Chair, the two religious groups also have captured or have had ways of verses which, in a way, tries to regulate, in my mind, sexual behavior. And I read, 
Among the Christians, when reading the Bible, I came across 1 Corinthians 6.18. I'm not um, a religion scholar. I hope I get it right. But it says, flee sexual immorality. Everything other than sin, every other sin that a person commits is outside their body. But a sexually immoral person sins against his own body. These are things we told in church. So let us abstain. But are they working? Are we abstaining? Are they abstaining? I do not know. Chair, and um, there's um, an Islam scholar here. I hope, Sheikh, I hope I, I got this right. Quran 24 2 says, The woman or man found guilty of sexual intercourse lash each one of them with a hundred lashes. <laughs> and do not be taken by pity for them in the religion of Allah. If you should believe in Allah in the last day, and let a group of believers witness their punishment. Quran 24.2. Sheikh, I hope I got it right. Now, these are ways by which religiously, the religious moral regime has found a way to regulate sexual behavior. Now come the fourth regime, which is what I call the romantic regime, where it's all about love, attraction, over any other factor. So those who find themselves in this regime don't care about the, um, the traditional regime, the religious regime, or the legal regimes. For them, what matters is that I'm in love, so I'm good to go. But uh, these, it's, it's not as if society has not done anything so far. Society has done so many things, has put in place so many um, structures. But are they working? Are they effective? I don't know. And this brings me to the focus of my lecture today, the forbidden fruits. What are these forbidden fruits? Chair, I know a lot of people are curious about what these forbidden fruits are, but I hope I did not disappoint them. Chair, in my search for where I will find where the concept or the phrase forbidden fruits, I read the Bible. I'm not a religious scholar, but I did Aris. And I did Biki, so I remember what I did. If you turn to Genesis 3 following, chair, the account of the forbidden fruits is captured there. I'm sure the um, men of God here um, can attest to that. When Eve, the serpent tempted Eve, Eve gave the apple to Adam, Adam ate it and all that. And Adam failed the first test. Because when God asked Adam, Adam, where are you? He said, I'm naked. And I believe that's why I probably failed O-level math, because Adam failed that test. <laughs> if Adam had not failed that test, probably I wouldn't have failed. The, the question was simple. Where are you? Tell the Lord you're under the tree. But I said, I am naked. <laughs> Chair, I'm not a lawyer, but I also hear and I've read that in law, the forbidden fruit is there and is captured in law. And for the, for the forbidden fruit in law is, law is an exclusionary rule to make evidence inadmissible in court if it was derived from evidence that was obtained illegally. Lawyer, Jete, and um, Abiu, I hope it's right. So in law, there's also the forbidden fruit. That's not what I'm talking about. Neither am I talking about the forbidden fruit in the Bible. The forbidden fruit I'm talking about is a metaphor for anything that is desirable but not moral, legal, or permissible to indulge in. That is the forbidden fruit that I'm talking about. So that is the forbidden fruit that I'm serving you this afternoon. Chair, the forbidden fruit in this context is risky sexual behavior. What makes sexual behavior risky? Chair, we are told that any rules conduct that increases his or her susceptibility to STIs and other adverse outcomes, including HIV and AIDS, unintended pregnancies, and psychological distress, is considered a risky sexual behavior. And research shows that it is one of the behavioral problems of public health concern, and the evidence abound that young people engage in risky sexual behaviors, young people in Ghana included. Chair, some of these risky sexual behaviors are early 
sexual intercourse. And here, when I talk about early sexual intercourse, I'm talking about sexual intercourse that happens before the age of consent. So sex before age 16 is too early, and it's associated with increased rates of STIs because the woman's system is not well developed. It's also associated with having more sexual partners. If you start early, you see the reproductive age starts at 15 and ends at 49. If you start early, invariably you're going to have many. Assuming that you change a partner every three years. Over a 30 year period, you'll be doing about 10 partners. And multiple sexual partner relationships has a lot of risk. It also um, leads to inconsistent use of contraceptives. It leads to un unintended pregnancies, and so on and so forth. The other forbidden fruit, something that is desirable, but not moral or accepted, is early marriage. Here, when we marry women before the legal age of marriage, which is 18, we are eating a forbidden fruit. And marriages in our context are usually as a link to childbirth. There's no way you can marry and say you are waiting for the young woman to grow before you start having children. Society expects you to give birth immediately you marry. And when this happens, we are putting the young woman's risk, uh, life at risk. We put in the children's life at risk. So early marriage is also a forbidden fruit. The other forbidden fruit is multiple sexual partners. Whether they are concurrent or serial, they are a forbidden fruit. Because if you have multiple sexual partners, you're likely to contract HIV, AIDS. You're likely to lower your guard and not use contraception or condoms, and you can um, get unplanned pregnancy. And unplanned pregnancies, usually for these young women, would be will lead to um, um, unsafe abortion. And this will lead to loss of life. So this is also a forbidden fruit. Sex under the influence of alcohol is a forbidden fruit. So those of you who want to drink something before you have sex, it is a forbidden fruit that you are eating. <laughs> because the alcohol will impair your judgment. And that would make somebody who even plans using the condom or contraceptive, um, your grace forgive me, I'm an academic and not a Catholic today, so permit me to talk about condoms. <laughs> Anybody who would wish to use a condom and will have the condom in the pocket, might forget he, or, he has the condom when um, he, or, he or she is under the influence of alcohol. So this is also a forbidden fruit. Unprotected sex or inconsistent constant use of condoms is also a forbidden fruit. Some are not using it at all, some use it. And interestingly, among young women and young people, first sex condom, second sex condom, then a man will come, don't you trust me, don't you know me? They lower your get. When you lower your guard, STIs will come in, unplanned pregnancy will come in, abortions will follow. So this is also a forbidden fruit. The last forbidden fruit I want to talk about is age mixing. Somebody will ask, how do you mix ages? You call them sugar daddies, you call them sugar mummies, you call them zazis, you call them puppies, whatever. You are mixing age. <laughs> now, when you mix age, there are power relations in there. An older man, a younger girl, he's your bank ruler, your, fi your finance minister, your energy, energy minister, all that. How do you negotiate safe sex with that person? You cannot. So you are eating a forbidden fruit. The older men, the older women, invariably have more experience. They have a, a longer exposure time. Maybe he started at 60 or 16, he's 50. How many years of exposure? You are eating a forbidden fruit if you do any of these. Chair, what causes us to eat these forbidden fruits? One of the reasons why people eat these forbidden fruits is that there's poor bonding at home. Parents have shared their responsibilities. Households are the ones taking them, take care of these young ones. There's very limited support. You are not home to even hear them. They will find somebody else to hear them. And those who usually hear them are those who would get them to eat the forbidden fruits. There are some inappropriate parenting rules and role models. So you are home, your mother, a sing, you're a single mother, a single parent, 
or home where anything goes. Daddy goes and never comes back. Mommy goes and never comes back. It's normal. Mommy has two boyfriends. Big sister has two boyfriends. So what? I can also have them. So environments are also not very conducive. There's a community in town. I wouldn't want to mention the community's name. At age 14, 15, because all parents are living in a single room with their kids, they will send the young girls to go to town to do something, to look for somewhere else to stay. If you send your 14, 15 year old to go and look for somewhere to stay at night, what are you expecting of that person? Whose house is he going to, she going to sleep in? So they're forbidden for to be eating. Chair, evidence has it that poor academic performance and high um, peer pressure leads to experimentation with sex and the eating of forbidden fruits. Next slide, please. Chair, at this point, I want to look at data and I'm going to show you evidence of the eating and the eating. Some have eaten it, others are still eating it. Chair, I'm using data from the Ghana Demographic and Health Survey. I must say that the current round of survey is not, the data is not publicly available, so I'm using data from 1988, 1993, 1998, 2004, and I think 2014. Those who were 15 to 24 years in 1988, I believe some of them are in this room, the, gener the generation X. So anybody who's between 50 and 59 in this audience will show you the fruits you eat. Your children are here with you, the millennials and the gen Generation Z. There are 24 to 23 year olds in here. They are still eating. Um, I can see shake, shaking the head because Zaki is here. So we'll use graphs to predict, um, show the data. I'll we'll try to look at some determinants of this um, eating of the forbidden fruits, which I call risky sexual behavior. Chair, in 1988, 43.7% of young people aged 15 to 24 years had sex before age 16. It has reduced to 24.8, 27.8, sorry. So when you are home and you're saying that you are, your children are worse off than you were, please think again. Maybe and maybe they are living their lives in the media. Whilst you led your life behind cupboards, that is why you think you did better than they are doing. But what it is that you were having sex, those who were 15 to 24 years, who are now 50 to 59 years, were having, 43.7 were having early sex. But now this has reduced to 27.8. Next slide, please. Now, the forbidden fruits of multiple sexual partners. We're using data from 2003 to 2014 because the first, um, at the earlier surveys did not collect data on risky sexual behavior. In 2003, 9.74% of 15 to 24 year olds had multiple sexual partners. Here we're talking about more than two, two or more partners. This has increased to 63%. So the current generation, the generation Z and millennials are engaging in more multiple sexual partner relationships than the, their fathers and their mothers. Why this is the case, I'm sure we can all find um, reasons. We can blame it on the media because some of us want to always blame the media. But why don't you blame it on poor parental care and guidance? Why don't you blame it on poor bonding? And why don't you blame it on yourself? Don't blame the media. Let's blame ourselves as parents. We're not doing good enough. Next slide, please. The forbidden fruits of early marriage. Again, 
1988, 61.2% of 15 to 24 year olds married under age 18 years. This has also seen some reduction. It's come to 54.2. The current generation, those who are younger, are not doing badly, but the decline is not good enough. And knowing that early marriage leads to early births, and early births is a risky um, behavior, we need to find a way to ensure that we reduce the risks. Next, please. Chair, condom use has always been a problem in this country. And I want to believe that it's probably the Catholic Church's influence. I'm not blaming the church, Your Grace. Condom use is very low. Knowledge about condoms is very high, but we're not using it. Less than 6% used condoms in 1998 when data was collected. And currently, or the, at the last data point, 2014, was less than 7%. So what it means is that our young people are not using the condoms, but our young people are having sex. Our young people are having multiple sexual partner relationships. Our young people are mixing with ages, but they are not using condoms. So what is going to happen to us? And it is, it is not surprising that this commission is not crying that the infection rates are going up. So I think we need to look at this carefully. I will not advocate for condom use because when I do, I have to go for confession. I don't know if um, I'll be permitted to confess that sin. <laughs> but your grace indulge me as my leader at church. It is important that if we are not ready to use these condoms, then let us abstain. And when I said abstinence, I didn't hear yeah from the crowd because they don't want to abstain. The rule is abstain, be faithful, or use condoms. A, B, C. But sometimes they're faithful. Who's being faithful? That I know you, I don't know you thing. It doesn't really cut it. So we have a problem. We have a challenge. These foods have been eaten in the past. These foods have been eaten. And we need to find a way to ensure that those who are eating the fruits would eat them the right way. Those who have eaten it in the past, there's very little we can do about them. But let's worry more about those who are eating it now and will continue eating it in the slides. So what I did was to try to use the two data points to find out what factors will explain or will expose somebody to risky sexual behavior from the data. And I found out that from the 1998 data, those who were, this is a logistic regression thing, I don't want to bore you with those things. Those who were more likely to engage in sex, risky sexual behavior were those who were of older ages, 20, 20, 24. Maybe they had waited because, well, the median age at first sex is 17, so if they go past 17, they think they can do whatever they want to know. It might be one of the reasons why they are the ones having risky sexual behaviors. Now, it's interesting that the northern region, or those who lived in the northern region, were at the lower risk or at lower odds of engaging in risky sexual behavior. What is it about the northern region that made them um, not engage in risky sexual behavior? We need to find out. Are there some belief systems? Are there some, some cultural norms and so on and so forth? Now, in 2024, 2014, sorry, we realized that those who were engaged in agriculture were less likely to engage in risky sex. Maybe they came back home too tired after farming, after weeding, to want to think about sex. Those who lived in female-headed households were at higher odds. They were more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior. Um, our mothers, what is happening? Because I thought that those female-headed households are where mummies will share their experiences with the girls so that the girls will not um, engage in risky sexual behavior. But maybe, and maybe, there's poor bonding even when they are there. And that's why they are engaging in risky sexual behavior. Secondary school education exposed you to risky sexual behavior. Um, place of residence, those who were of the world, uh, middle world index 
were less likely to engage in risky sexual behavior. Those who lived in rural areas um, were less likely to engage in risky beha behaviors. Well, if you live in a village and everybody knows everybody, why would you want to have two boyfriends? So maybe the issue of not being anonymous was a factor in here. Next slide, please. What are the short-term implications of eating of these fruits? Chair, increased exposure to unwanted pregnancies. And I have said it earlier on, unwanted pregnancies and pregnancies to young women, whether they are in marriage or out of marriage, is a risk, risky behavior, and it's not something that we should encourage. Most of these pregnancies would be aborted, and most of the abortions would be done by quacks, and the evidence abounds. So we should ensure that these do not happen. Now there will also be the issue of STIs, STDs, and um, it is important for us to acknowledge the fact that STIs among women, most of them do not show symptoms. And because they do not show symptoms, these young women will carry the STIs for life, and it might create future problems, which include, among others, infertility. Next slide. Chair, there are what I call the long-term implications, and here I think that if nothing is done about the eating of these forbidden fruits, we will have some long-term implications. And for me, it, is, it will shake the foundation on, on, of our health, our well-being, and our education. Because there are transitions that a young person will have to go through into, while they go into adulthood. These transitions are schooling, health, citizenship, work, and family formation. When you get pregnant as a young woman, what will happen to you? You don't, most likely will drop out of school. But as you tell you, has the policy changed? So you drop out of school. Now, when you drop out of school, definitely you will not develop your potential. You cannot, socially, you will not be well developed. Economically, you will not be well developed. So when, and those who would drop out will drop out, but some of them will abort, and the abortion will have health implications where people would die, some would have fistulas, and so on and so forth. Now, um, a poorly schooled citizen, a, poor, uh, a citizen with poor health, I believe will not be a good citizen. When you're not able to attain the highest levels in education and you don't have the, um, the best of health, how are you going to work and how are you going to be productive? So the transition into the world of work will also be affected. Now, when you carry an STI onto adulthood and you get to a point where you cannot give birth, issues will happen in your family. So issues of family formation comes in. So these risky sexual behaviors or these fruits, forbidden fruits, when eaten, are likely to lead to some of these um, implications. And these would have dire consequences for our um, nationhood and economic development. Prof. Chair, when this happens, the, what the, if the transition into adulthood happens, then I, I, I shudder to think that we might not be able to achieve SDGs goals one, two, three, four, and five. You want to reduce poverty while your population is not going to school. You have a very sick population. How do you reduce poverty? Prof. Chair, you want to, if you are not reducing poverty, then hunger cannot be reduced. I think that's not something we should even debate. If these fruits are eaten and are not eating well, it will affect the health of the citizens. So we might not be able to achieve one, two, three. And if it, the women are dropping out of school because they are eating the forbidden fruits, then how do you achieve the target of quality education? There will be no gender um, equality if there's age mixing and so on and so forth. So Chair, these for me are some of the long-term implications of the eating of the forbidden fruit. Chair, some concluding thoughts. I'm not going to make recommendations. I want to have some concluding thoughts. I believe that the transition into adulthood offers us a critical window of opportunity to invest in education health, and so on and so forth. The best thing we can do, Chair, is to ensure that as a country, we focus our attention on ensuring that we develop the skills and potential of our, the future generation, those age 15 to 24, because if we do this, and we do it well, we would get a benefit from this um, what population. The, the size is huge. So when we get them well-educated, in good health, and they move into adulthood, 
they are going to create a certain labor force that can propel economic development. So it's important we invest in them so we can achieve the benefit of the dividend. Chair, we need to find a way to impact healthy lifestyles and habits, including sexual behavior. And one of the things we can do is to give big group, the adults should be good role models for them. It is important we serve as good role models. Chair, it is important also for us to ensure that we equip our young ones with the best of education, with the best of strategies to survive this. We've said this before, um, Professor Abu is here, did a comprehensive sexual education. I don't want to go into that subject because it, it invokes a lot of passion. I'm not going to say you should go and bring back SE, but what I'm saying is that let us have age appropriate, culturally sensitive, religiously sensitive, reproductive health education for young people. And here, when we are doing this, let us not see young people as a homogeneous population. Yes, they are homogeneous, but there's a lot of heterogeneity in them. And let us explore all the heterogeneities that exist among young people to ensure that we give them education that is appropriate. While some are eating the fruits, some are not eating the fruits. How do you ensure that you protect them and ensure that they don't eat the fruits? Those who are eating the fruits, can they stop? If they can't stop, is there any way they can eat the fruits in such a way that they will not be forbidden? These are things that we need to be looking at. So I also believe that we need to create safe spaces in our environment for young people to express their sexuality. When it comes to expression of sexuality we get, and creating our safe spaces, we get worried. But what I'm trying, I'm pushing is that let's look at how we can have formal and informal places where women and girls would feel physically and emotionally safe. Where they can talk about sex and their sexuality without violence, without stigma, without discrimination. Where we can give them support to live their sexuality. Because mind you, sexuality will be begin at birth and until you die, you exhibit some sexuality. And the best way we can do, the best thing we can do is to give them the support they need. Chair, also, I think that we need to provide holistic services. Many a times, we create products for young people, youth-friendly center, youth corners. Have they worked? Why don't we have a host, holistic system? It's a, there's a hospital. In that hospital is a youth corner. Or in that hospital is a facility or a service provider. So that when I'm entering the space, people will not start um, gossiping. Oh, he's going. He's going to do an abortion. No. Anybody, everybody goes to the hospital. When I'm going to the hospital, nobody knows what exactly I'm going to do. But when I'm going to a huge corner, everybody knows what I'm going to do in a huge corner. And I think that we need to find a way to ensure that services that target these young people are holistic and also cater for their minds and their body. It's, a, it's important, Prof. Chair, to ensure that whatever we do provides for the minds and body of these young women. Chair, I want to believe I've served you a dish of um, forbidden fruits. I'm not sure how palatable or how healthy you love that dish. But having served you that dish, I want to just touch on a few things that I've done over these last 15 or so years. There are a number of them, but I've chosen just eight of them. Each of these eight papers that I've chosen has a story. Some of the stories are sad. Some of them are interesting. Um, now, now, let's start from eight. Yeah, the first paper that I did as a lecturer, I was appointed a lecturer in 2007. When I came in, I thought being a lecturer was all about teaching. I had the energy, I would teach and teach and teach. When I finished teaching, I would go and, those of you who know me, I would go and do the other things. So I wasn't paying attention to research. I struggled and managed to do my, have my first paper. And I'd been advised by my father, my mentor, my coach, to start by doing a single or third paper. It took me four years. 2011, and it coincided with my, uh, marriage. Maybe, and maybe, marriage got me stable. And marriage got me to start writing. Thank you very much, Flory. 
this report came out in 2011 when I just married. Before marriage, I think I was doing that. I was just gallivanting and I wasn't working, but she got me to work. The seven and eight with a eight, um, eight, seven, six were papers that went in for my application to senior lecturership. There is five. My passion for women, women's decision making. I wanted to look at women's reproductive health decision making and what whether women could take decisions for themselves. So you ask them simple questions. If you know that your husband is cheating, can you avoid, can you put, um, avoid having sex with him? The woman said no. It's socially not accepted. And even the educated ones said they could not say no to men who they knew were cheating. A woman, empowers empowerment, where is equality? Let's look at that. These are things that you can find in that paper. Um, let's go up. No, no. Now, therefore, Prof. Chair has a lot of stories around it. Young man has applied for, applied for full, um, as a professorship. He thought he was ready. He knew he was ready. The process starts. Like, if you don't bring a sole letter paper, your application documents will not go. Initially, I wanted to fight because there was no rule, there's nothing in the statute that says that. I don't know whether it was a trap that I had to navigate. I was very angry after writing letters. And any time I want to do something and I meet my father, my mind changes. I had finished writing the letter, I was going to print it, and I met him in the corridor. Kofi, what is wrong with you? Why are you so angry? Say, said, Prof, this is what is happening. Say, so you come to my office. Kofi, do you know that is how the system works? <laughs> it was done to me, so don't worry. You can do it. Go and do the paper for them. Don't fight anybody. Thank you very much, Prof. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had done this paper. I had comments. But I, had, I knew I didn't need it to apply for that stage. So I was waiting to carry it forward. But it had to change. So this paper was produced, Early Sexual Intercourse and Age Mixing Among Older Adolescents in Urban Slums in Ghana, was my get out of jail paper to associate professorship. And I'm happy it did. And I did it. And thank you very much to my brother, my friend, the Vice Chancellor of CCTU, Kweku Edichung Boache, for standing by me during those turbulent times and days. God bless you. Chair, three, two, and one went for professorship. One especially was done because I had been forewarned that if you don't bring your soul, you won't go. So I didn't want to fall into the trap again. So I gave them one which is titled Individual and Contextual Practices of Comprehensive HIV AIDS Knowledge Among Female Ghanaians. The motivation to write the paper was the fact that HIV AIDS knowledge is near universal. And theory tells us that once knowledge gets, diffusion gets to 84%, there's nothing to add. But we had got into 98%, but behavior change was not moving. So can, I look, can we look at knowledge differently. Instead of say, asking questions, do you know? Have you heard? Can we do something else? So we measured comprehensive sexuality, um, comprehensive HIV knowledge, which is knowing about, knowing the sources of um, HIV information and having less than two um, stigmatizing or discriminating um, behaviors or attitudes. That's what I did. And I realized that Comprehensive sexuality education actually, uh, com comprehensive HIV knowledge actually was less than 40%. And I believe that that is the sort of knowledge level that we are. Because if you look at having usage of less than 10%, then it is not the 80% or 90% knowledge that is driving it, but it's rather the 40%. So I think, I think that that's, that's what that paper was about. And there are so many others, I believe, those who are interested can read. Chair in the young career managed to 
work with colleagues to train five PhDs, then 30 plus um, for, um, um, masters. We have trained a few people I can call my mentors, and I mentioned a few of them. And um, the man in the corner pushing the buttons is one of them, and I'm very proud of him. I've been um, in student management since I got here. I came in 2007, 2008, I got involved, and I'm still in it. And I believe there are so many student leaders that I've worked with, and I've mentored them. They say I, I mafia them, but um, I believe we all, they've all come back to support them. We've done a good thing. Um, shout out to Rams and um, Ku. Dennis Sapia, I believe he's here, the Nooks president. These are people who have gone through mentoring with me. I also have served and continue to serve on some national boards in a bid to contribute to national development. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do it. Let's do it for Professor Eugene Koforma Fudate. As he takes his seat, he'll be back pretty shortly to acknowledge a few people who have contributed to his journey to this point and also a few more who are here to support him. But ahead of that, I would invite the choir to give us an interlude. Kuru 
thank you very much. Help me welcome Professor Eugene Kufoma for Date back upstage as he makes a few acknowledgements. I believe you can clap for him better. Okay. He says they are not a few. Um, a tall list he has, I guess. Thank you very much, Akosia. Um, I don't think thank you is enough. Um, that's why I got the choir to sing. Then I'm in front of Yehovahse. It's been a very challenging journey from birth to now. And it's still challenging. Because a false step means that those behind me will also make four steps. So I will always have how to ensure that I will rely on the Almighty God for guidance. And he has been faithful. So my first acknowledgement goes to the Lord God Almighty for how far he's brought me. And I commit the rest of my life unto his care. And my prayer always is that may his will be done in my life. Amen. To the Vice Chancellor and Management for giving me this opportunity to serve a dish of forbidden fruits, I say thank you very much. To my mom and dad, Mr. and Mrs. Date, I'm happy you are seeing this, and I'm happy you are here to grace the occasion. Thank you for everything that you've done for myself, for Kwame, for Efiasewa and Mamiya, and all your, <clears throat> all your grandchildren and nephews and nieces. To my grandmother, who is, I'm happy she's still alive and is here with us. Nanecha Namin Shao. Empire Bonnie said, Obekos Wafi also. Now, Odo Bechain in Ecosi, Tam or Noa Bekas, the Wabre, Umbre, Unco Bebia, Chain Chain, Edas. To my Miss Yama and my Miss Sapong, the two girls in my house. To my mother in law who's here with us, Mrs. Esiama. The late Captain Retired Kwesi Siyama, may his soul rest in peace. An in-law, a father-in-law I could share one with. And Captain gave me a note. When I married, I went to his house to marry the daughter. He gave me a handwritten note on how to treat the daughter. And I still have the note. I'm not sure the daughter has seen it, and I'll never show it to her. <laughs> My little secret. Captain, thanks very much. During our wedding, you know, I'm a Casfordian. Fellow Casfordians. Yeah. The Casfordians were there, and they were singing their songs. And I thought they were disgracing me. Because <laughs> well, they were singing just behind Captain's window. So I said, Charlie, guys, stop, 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 Charlie. When you go for that post weddings, you do it. So they did it to me. Then I saw this man come with his walking stick with a sweet bottle of whiskey. He said, Kofi, give it to your friends. I love what they are doing. <laughs> Captain May also rest in peace. When Professor Yanko Samson delivered his lecture, he said, teachers matter. Indeed, teachers matter. And some teachers have played great roles in my life. I'll start with those who taught me in the university. Those, all of you who taught me in the university, I acknowledge you. There are many of them here. Forgive me, but I cannot but mention the one who just entered the room again. Professor Benjamin Kofi Awasabwasari. <laughs> you know, he has Benjamin in his name, but he's, he's, he's been... Bernard, sorry. Bernard in his name. But he said he's a traditional person, so he dropped the Bernard. But today, permit me to call you Bernard. <laughs> Teacher Bernard, Medassi. He's been a father, he's been a mentor, and he's been a pillar behind me. We'll go and visit 
I'm not reminding you of your loss, but we'll go and visit Mama Jo. And I'll go and tell her that I've delivered my inaugural lecture and that I've arrived. <laughs> Mrs. Josephine Osobasari, wherever you are, this is to you. I appreciate all your support. Professor Delali Badasu is not here, one of my first teachers in the university. Professor Zabani Kumitreme Berimentri. Kumitreme is here, I believe um, he is not just a friend and a brother, he's also a teacher. And Berimentri, I call him Edura. Then you say Edura. I thank you all. At a secondary school level, my teachers are here. And I, I know Mr. Luke Jesiapia is not here, but he shaped our lives. He taught me how to wear a tie. And I love to wear a tie. The young man, you cannot take the tie off until you are back at base. So even up today, if I wear a tie, and I even go through a clubhouse, the tie will still be on. Thank you, Mr. Jesiapia. Mr. Emisa, Mr. Kumsin, who's, um, Kumsin Bans, who's here, thank you very much. So the late Mr. Pamensa of Infantry Secondary School. I believe George and Alfred are somewhere in the hall. Tell Daddy, I said thank you. The primary school I had Mrs. Aoku, Mrs. Derry, Mrs. Teresa Frimpon, my head teacher, Mr. Amankwa Mensa. He will lash you for you to love him for being lashed, for lashing you. They all have shaped our lives, and they've shaped my life. Mr. Akwa did not, was not a teacher in um, UPS, but Mr. Akwa, thank you very much. <laughs> so, the people I call my spiritual fathers and directors and support this, the Archbishop Gabriel Pamabako, I know he would have loved to be here. Your grace, please extend my appreciation to him. To your grace yourself, you've always been there for me. I very I appreciate you. To Monsignor Reverend James Myers, thank you very much. Father Amos, Father Quinning, and all the associate priests of Our Lady City of Wisdom, thank you very much. To my friend and my brother, Dr. Mustafa Amit, CENP, I appreciate you for your support from our school days and everything that you continue to do. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. He's with Mr. Abu Jackson, who's the head of H the HR director for NPA. Oh, we sit together at a committee and um, we do our own thing. Mr. Jackson, thank you. Madam Shilado, thank you for gracing this occasion. Uncle Eko, review. Please stand and let Your father was a former Vice Chancellor. See Aka. That is the son. Please get up and let him see you. <laughs> Chair, ladies and gentlemen, I know that there's a gentleman in this hall. I've not seen him, but I know he's here. Mr. Kwame Zephak, are you here? The Chairman General is here. So as I talk about MPA, I cannot help but acknowledge a board member of MPA, Mr. Kwame Sefakai. Thank you very much for gracing this occasion. And all those who came with, we appreciate your support. I want to believe that I can appreciate the regional minister, the central gold, I know she's not here, but um, my appreciation goes to her. The Honorable MCE, Chair and members of the HR Committee, I appreciate all of you. The IGS of the National Schools Inspectorate Authority, Dr. Hilda Hager, if you are hampered, give me a wave. When you meet her outside, she'll say, I'm her boss, but she's my little sister. Thank you very much. With the directors and the board members, I have the, C, um, the CEO of, I think, the director general for NTC is here. I can see him in his, I can't see the hat, but I know he's somewhere. Naka, boss is here. Prof, 
Thank you very much. Dr. Eitersen, thank you very much. And he came with your boss, lawyer Jete. Lawyer, Medas. Maria, I can see you. Miss Rita, my controller at Nasia. The deputy IGSs are here. ODK, is ODK in the hall? I call him ODK. Governor Mesa, thank you very much. Don't, don't, don't hide your face, um, young man. Deputy IGS service, you're here, thank you very much. Nana, I was going to ask you, Professor Kweku Ehim, Vice Chancellor. I believe this is your first official assignment. Vice Chancellor, please get up and let them acknowledge you. <laughs> Kweku is a mate from University Primary, St. Augustine's College. When I was doing Poplar, he was doing tourism. So we've come from somebody say far away. University Primary School, my mates, where are you? Stand up and let them see that I have some mates from the primary school. They are, they are all gray men, gray hair, bald hair like myself. Absu. 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 Monica Nimba. Cape 91. Cape 91. Cape 91 is a group of young men and women who completed St. Augustine's at the Sado College in France, Pim. Holy Child, Wesley Girls, and Fancy Man. They've come together to form a group called Cape 91. It's a large social group, and they've always been supportive. Now, within Cape 91, there's UTT. You want to know what UTT stands for? Under the tree. <laughs> UTT meets under a tree in Laboni. Good friends. Fellow Casfordians. Hey. Fellow Casfordians. Hey. Thank you very much, Casford alumni. The guinea pigs for population and health, Poplar 1999. I believe some of them are here. I acknowledge you. To my heads of house, I salute you. To my senior assistant registrar, who is my boss in the office, and the staff of ODS, I appreciate your support. There's a lady I choose to call Gucci Grace. I won't mention her real name, but she knows herself. She puts that the appellations and the drama bit. So I said, Prof, who is a prof? I'll do this for you. Take your eyes off and it will, it will happen. Grace Gucci, thank you very much. <laughs> so all the members of Knights of St. John International, I say I thank you and I appreciate you. To Professor Dora Edubwando, former Pro Vice Chancellor. Mom, thank you very much. Professor GK Teodro, Professor Didi Kumpoli, Professor John Nelson Boa, Professor Isaac Galeon, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Professor Adobe, my teacher, he taught me ethics of population in level 300, was my pro vice chancellor. He employed me as a vice chancellor. I've grown up and I still see him as my teacher, but he wants to treat me as a colleague. We served on subcommittees, we worked together. Prof. I appreciate you. I appreciate your wise counsel always. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Joshua Anamamesa, Professor J. J. Anamamesa, thank you very much for your support. The registrar, thank you very much, senior. I call him senior. And he's my in-law because the wife is my twin sister from another mother. Born on the same day, sat in the same class for six years. That's how far we go with Nora. Nora, continue supporting my senior for me. <laughs> JW and Sam Parker Cole, 
to my sons, Dr. Kwame Nasechi Dixon. Thank you for being loyal sons. And to Mr. Aziz Seidu, I thank you. To all current and former student leaders, I appreciate you. We've had our banters, but I believe you all, we've all moved out being better persons. The list is very tall. I wouldn't want, I know Major is coming to tell me to cut it. <laughs> yeah. Major, I have the mic, so I won't listen to what you say to me. <laughs> Dr. Isaac Ohine, for giving me my admission letter, for sending my forms as a supplement, supplementary list so I could do my master's. Doc, I'm very grateful. I appreciate the College of Professors for turning out. And I want to single out the chair. The chair is not feeling too well. But chair, you are here to support. I appreciate you. To all the patriots in the house, you know yourselves. I won't list you. I throw a salute. <coughs> Sorry. Where is this going? To the Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences, and staff of the faculty, thank you very much. To the head of department and staff, Department of Population and Health, I thank you very much. To the all provosts, especially to my provost, Provost College of Humanities and Legal Studies, I thank you all. To Dr. and Mrs. Dodu, Somewhere in the hall, Daddy and Mommy made one and CP for showing up. He promised to be here and he's represented. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I have 150 names and groups. I don't want to bore you. I'll meet you soon, somewhere. So with the permission of the chair, I wish to acknowledge all of you for gracing this occasion. Mrs. Ajiman, Medasi Mami. We'll meet again in the next 30 minutes somewhere, and I'll acknowledge you properly by shaking your hands and her giving you hugs. In the meantime, permit me, permit me, since the voice is going, I want to save some of the voice for the next session. Permit me to say a big thank you to all of you here in Garnet for your prayers, for your support, and for your love. God bless you all. Thank you. Let's do it again for Professor Eugene Kofoma for that day. At this point, I'll call on the College of Professors. They have a brief ceremony to perform, and this is the robing section of this lecture. This is an official way of welcoming Professor Date into the college. So let's welcome the, uh, the College of Professors as they come up stage to perform the robing. We can do it better for them whilst they come. Sorry, whilst uh, my senior colleagues come in, I wish to acknowledge one person before they do the ceremony. Professor Margaret Japon, you've come all the way from UHAS. There's also <laughs> Professor Elvis Takan from UHAS. I appreciate you coming all the way from Ho and Howard to grace this occasion. Thank you very much. On behalf of College of Professors and on behalf of our chairman, Professor Yeboa Mensa, I heartily, uh, I heartily welcome 
Professor Ma Fudete into the College of Professors. Thank you very much. I'll call on the Pro Vice Chancellor and the Registrar to also take turns to congratulate Professor Malfodate. I would invite former Vice Chancellor UCC, Professor Emmanuel Adobing, to also congratulate Professor Marfo Tate. The Chairman of the College of Professors, UCC, Professor S.Y. Minsa, please. Former Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Francisque Dubando, Dora Francisque Dubando, kindly come up. Former Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Nelson Boa. As a Former providers come up. I wish to acknowledge the presence of Professor Abel Bonzi Simpson, the Vice Chancellor, Methodist University College of Ghana. Thank you very much, Uncle Abel. On that note, I would invite Uncle Abel to come up and then congratulate Professor Date. Dr. Isaac Ohine, former registrar UCC, would also take his turn to congratulate Professor Marfo Date. Mr. Mustafa Hamid, please, can, Dr. Mustafa Hamid, forgive me, kindly take your turn to congratulate him. I would invite the wife and daughter of Professor Eugene Marfudate to take their turn. And they'll be followed by family. They'll be followed by family. Family, family members, please. Please come up stage, family members. The parents will lead.
the parents of Professor Eugene Kufoma for that, uh, congratulating him now. The grandmother takes her turn to congratulate him. Now, other family members will take their turn. The mother-in-law also takes her turn to congratulate Professor Date. After family will be friends. Friends will take their turn to congratulate him. All friends of Professor Eugene Kufoma for that day. Friends of Professor Date.
after the friends, we'll have staff of the Office of Dean of Students coming up to congratulate Professor Date. Staff of the Office of Dean of Students, Staff of the Office of Dean of Students, please take your turn. Now congratulating him now is the former Member of Parliament for Cape Coast North, the Honorable Barbara Asha AC. of the Office of Dean of Students would be followed by Department of Population and Health. Department of Population and Health. Department of Population and Health would be followed by Faculty of Social Sciences. Department of Population and Health, followed by Faculty of Social Sciences. They would be followed by NASIA. They would be followed by NASIA. of ODS have a citation to present to Professor Date and they are permitted to read briefly. If the choir can just lower the tune for us a bit so we can hear the reader. I read the citation on behalf of all staff of the Office of the Dean of Students. Professor Eugene Kufo Mafo Date, congratulations on your successful inaugural lecture. Your commitment to excellence and innovation in administration has been instrumental in driving the Office of the Dean of Students forward. We are proud to be a part of your team. You are a visionary leader and we will continue to learn from your expertise and leadership. Congratulations on this well-deserved achievement. Aiko from staff of the Office of the Dean of Students. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, staff of the Office of Dean of Students. Please.
Professor Date, this is on behalf of the team that you were part of that did the qualitative evaluation of the first malaria vaccine to be introduced in Ghana. Congratulations. Now the Department of Population and Health would also present a citation to Professor Date. My view. Congratulations, Prof. Eugene K. M. Date. You are the first fruit of the Department of Population and Health to reach the highest status in academia. Your footprint in teaching and research are far-reaching evidence of hard work and excellence. Thank you. Congratulations, Prof. Okay, so the Faculty of Social Sciences is also presenting a citation in honor of Prof Professor Eugene Kofo Mafudate. Okay. Faculty of Social Sciences. Citation in honor of Professor Eugene Kofo Mafudate. The entire Faculty of Social Sciences extends its heartfelt congratulations to you on the occasion of your inaugural lecture. Your contributions to the university and the Faculty of Social Sciences in particular have been invaluable and we are proud of, we are proud to have you as part of our community. Your research and teaching in the field of population and health have been instrumental in shaping the direction of our faculty and we are grateful for the impact that you have made. We are honored to celebrate this momentous occasion with you and we look forward to the many more achievements that lie ahead. Congratulations once again, and we wish you continued success in all your future endeavors. Congrats, Prof. So they'll make a presentation to Prof. Date. Thank you very much, faculty of social sciences. Coming up, staff of NASIA will take their turn to congratulate Professor Date. Staff and board of NASIA. APSU, APSU 91, CAPE 91, UTT, you'll take your turn after this one. Kindly make your way upstage. APSU, Cape 91, UTT. Kindly make your way upstage. APSU, Cape 91, UTT. Making their way up, we have APSU, we have Cape 91, and UTT. Come 
Mohoka Sensia, who told ye, Papa, ready go. Mohoka Sensia, who told ye, Papa, no quanya mesum or sabe. A baby cat lay for one and him yam. I saw concord in church and ye pa. Mohoka Sensia, ye are not down for pa. Oh, Tony, Monica, Neba, say, and I saw Natchez, and I may have fat, and I may Santissimo Sacramento Hey! Action, I'm going to Thank you very much. St. Augustine College Old Boys, Cape 91 and UTT. Heads of Halls. All heads of halls here, kindly make your way upstage to congratulate Professor Date. They'll be followed by the boys' boys. Heads of halls will be followed by boys' boys. And then alumni UCC will follow. Boys, boys, kindly make your way upstage as well. Boys, boys. Boys, boys, led by a female professor. <laughs> so the head of halls would want to present a citation to Professor Date. Citation in honor of Professor Eugene Kufoma Fudate, Dean of Students, UCC. This citation is presented to Professor Eugene Kufoma Fudate in recognition of your outstanding accomplishment in your career and on the occasion of your inaugural lecture as a full professor at the University of Cape Coast. We recognize your consistent commitment to excellence, innovation, exemplary leadership and dedication to student success and your remarkable contributions to fostering an inclusive educational environment as the Dean of Students. Your exceptional skill, devotion, professionalism in handling potentially precarious situations on campus, rich experiences and vast knowledge in academia, social work and gender advocacy shape our achievements as heads of whole. You continue to work tirelessly in ensuring the investing community is safe for students. Through your numerous contributions as an educator, administrator, advisor, and an advocate of students, you have ultimately won the admiration of the committee of heads of whole and the entire student's body. Congratulations, Prof. Keep on excelling. We say, are you cool? And
and heads of halls congratulating Professor Date. They will be followed by the boys' boys, led by Professor Dora Francisca Duwando. I gather she's the mother of the boys. SRC, SRC UCC, followed by alumni. Alumni will crown the congratulatory session. SRC. <laughs> Prof, I gather this is a sister to the boys as well. SRC UCC. And we'll have alumni UCC, led by the national president, Mr. Samuel Danso. SRC. So SRC equally want to present a citation. Um. Citation in honor of Professor Eugene K.M. Date on the day of his inaugural lecture, 7 June 2023. Dear Professor, you are, like the, you are like the caring father who cannot sleep unless his children eat something, albeit not the forbidden fruit. Thank you. Alumni UCC, led by President of the National Association, Mr. Samuel Danso. Thank you very much, SRC. Thank you very much. Taking their turn is the National Association UCC alumni. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Prof. Date, you, you take your seat, but you'd have to descend the stairs and then shake hands with Nana before you take your seat. We can do it for Prof. As he makes his way to his seat, the applause could be better. <laughs> Kindly help me acknowledge a few personalities here who have graced this occasion. First on the list is the Vice Chancellor UCC, Professor Johnson Nyako Buampong. Let's also acknowledge Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Mrs. Rosemont Buohini. The Registrar, Mr. Jeff Te Emmanuel Onyame. The Chairman of the UCC College of Professors, Professor S.Y. Yabuamensa is also in our midst. Let me acknowledge the following members of the College of Professors. Professor Awusabu Asari. I would acknowledge former Pro Vice Chancellor UCC, who is also a member of the College, Professor George Odru. <laughs> Professor El Sam Amwa. Professor Ebobond Simpson. Professor J.V. Mensa. Professor Ewa Nyameche. Professor Sarah Dakwa. Reverend Professor Kankambuedu, Professor Yao Ankuma, Professor Francis Eric Amokwando, Professor Kweku Buachi, who is also the Vice Chancellor of the Cape Coast Technical University, and Professor Keba Bwasua. Kindly give us a wave together and we'll acknowledge all of you. Thank you very much. Let me go on and also acknowledge Reverend Professor Emmanuel Ado, being former Vice Chancellor UCC. 
Professor John Nelson Bua, former Pro Vice Chancellor UCC, and Professor Dora Francisca Dubuando, former Pro Vice Chancellor UCC. We also have in our midst a former registrar, Dr. Isaac Ohini. Give us a wave, sir. Thank you very much for being here. I'll quickly acknowledge all provost, provost of the College of Education, Professor Kofi Davis, College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences, Professor Moses Jojo Egan, College of Humanities and Legal Studies, Professor Kwame Osei Kwarteng, College of Distance Education, Professor Mohammed Anochi Adams, and the Provost of the College of Health and Allied Sciences, Professor Martins Eko. Kindly give us a wave all together and we acknowledge you. Thank you very much. To Nanakweku Enu Marahin of Ogwa, we say thank you very much for being here. We duly also acknowledge all Nananum who are here in present. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take the chairman's closing remarks. Let's welcome Professor Johnson Nyako Bwampong. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have all witnessed a comprehensive presentation given by Professor Date on the topic, Eating the Forbidden Fruits, Reflections on Risky Behaviors Among Young Women in Ghana Over the Last Three Decades. He talked about the fact that he had challenges in pursuing his academic career. But he was identified and then given intentional mentorship by Professor Awisabo Asari. And this reinforces the fact that as academicians, we need to identify the young ones and then mentor them so that they can become responsible citizens in the near future. And then Professor has done it. And that is why today, we have all witnessed the, this presentation. He gave the background about his presentation, the topic, uh, actually talking about stages of human development, focusing on adolescent period, where the body receives cascades of sex hormones, and that affect the behavior of the individuals. But the society has uh, regulations in place we have the social regimen, we have the legal regimen, religious. But those who wouldn't want to go by all the regimens in place, they, are the, they go by the romantic regimen. And then in the olden days, he talked about the fact that our ancestors were using taboo, actually to prevent some of these activities, especially in the bush. And the fact that uh, they can also prevent inbreeding. And so these are the things that the taboos that were in place to prevent this abnormal social beha uh, sexual behavior. Then the forbidden fruits. He, he actually said that it's a metaphor and it's, it is any fruit that is desirable but not, social, not morally acceptable. So, and he talked about the sexual beha risky behaviors, some of them HIV and AIDS, unintended pregnancy, early sex and its implications, early marriage and its implications, multiple sexual partners, sex under the influence of alcohol, unprotected sex, and the age mixing. He also presented the causes of um, risking sexual behavior. The fact that the young ones need bonding but they don't get it. And the fact that the parents are also not serving as role models, and then even the environment that they find themselves. He talked about the determinants of risk behavior in the 80s, and then the, two, the um, year 2000s. The short-term implications and the long-term implications. And he concluded that there should be the transitioning, transitional period to the adulthood offers 
opportunity for critical, asse uh, critical assessment and by providing uh, opportunity for young people to be mentored or to be educated and that we should um, make sure that we adopt culturally sensitive reproductive health education to give them the knowledge and then the skills to protect themselves. He said that we should create safe spaces where we can give um, sort of education and even if uh, the young people want to interact, at least they can be uh, supervised or they can be helped to behave in a manner that would not affect them. And then he talked about the need to adopt holistic services, especially in the hospitals, so that the young ones can go there and get all the education and then services that they need so that they can behave properly and not enter into a period where they will have problems about their life. But the take-home message is that can be found in um, Genesis 1, 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish, of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over everything that moves upon the earth. So we were charged to multiply, but we should not eat the forbidden fruits. And therefore, there are regiments set in place to guide us so that we get the lances to eat the proper food. Thank you. We'll take the closing prayer, and I would ask you to help me welcome Reverend Professor Kankam Buidu. Please let us be on our feet as we register our appreciation unto the Most High God. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things have done, in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms have blessed us all our way countless joys of love. Lord Almighty God, we register our appreciation unto you. We thank you for the opportunity created for your son to deliver his inaugural lecture. Your word has been fulfilled. We have seen the day you have allowed your son to explain the forbidden fruit. We pray, O oh Lord, that you give us the enablement to be able to abide and to work in constant direction of what he has espoused. Above all, as we live in, may your grace be upon us in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. We shall remain standing as the Vice Chancellor and his entourage exit this auditorium and the rest of us would follow. Nana would follow the Vice Chancellor as well. Your Grace, you can kindly follow the Vice Chancellor and his entourage as well. We would have a photo session out of this auditorium. So as you exit, you can join in and take photos with Professor Eugene Kufoma Fodate. Thank you so much for being a part of this inaugural lecture. My name is Akosu Achinabiasaki. It's been a pleasure serving you. We can kindly exit, thank you. <laughs>